Hi, this is Eric Brostowski. Welcome to another segment of EP on EP. And I'm delighted today to have with me a colleague for many years, Dr. Bradley Knight, who's the Director of Electrophysiology at Northwestern University. Brad, I'm going to welcome you here, even though you're at Tar Hill yep. and I'm a Dukey, but we're going to put those behind us. We'll keep that keep, aside. Keep that aside. Yep. So uh, you've done so much work in the cryoablation area, and what I'd like to talk to you about today is kind of what's new, but maybe you can start with the standard cryoablation, what you've learned, and what maybe the, uh, um, what the things that need fixing are, and then tell us where we're headed. Sure, sure. We, we, we adopted the cryo balloon for pulmonary vein isolation and the, with the first generation device. So at Northwestern we have seven faculty doing um, AFib ablation on a routine basis. We've all trained in different programs and we have different techniques and different ideas, but once we uh, took on the cryo balloon, all seven of us now have adopted it as kind of our go-to for first procedures for pulmonary vein isolation. And now with the second generation cryo balloon, there was a significant improvement. I think it's a very efficient way to isolate the veins. It's a very effective way. It's very safe. Uh, we participated in the um, STOP AFib post-approval trial where there were 340 patients followed for three years and the success rate as defined as freedom from AFib was 68%. And then we looked at the redo rate kind of as a surrogate for um, uh, you know, uh, who had AFib that was to the degree they needed to have another procedure and the freedom from a repeat procedure was about 82%. Uh, the circuit dose study just came out uh, comparing RF to cryo. They were comparable, but I think what that showed us is that these definitions we use of success may be a little strict, um, and they demonstrated, as you, you probably know, there was a 99% reduction in AFib burden. Yeah, that, so, I, well, you know, from the beginning of the guidelines for AFib ablation, I've been that one guy who never got his way. But I said 30 seconds is ridiculous. Yeah. No clinician in the world cares about 30 seconds, right. nor do any patients, right? So I think we have undervalued for the public how, how successful ablation is yeah. because we have... The public and our peers, our general yeah. cardiology colleagues. Yeah, who say, well, it doesn't, you know, right. works in 40%. And then you realize, no, someone right, who's had a terrible sort of quality of life now feels good even though they have the odd episode. Right. So I guess at least as comparable as RF. I think there's some other advantages. I think patients do better in the first couple months after the procedure that's not quite captured in some of these trials. That blanking period uh, is important to patients. But uh, it could be better. You know, we just... Um, you know, we routinely use the cryo balloon, but it has some limitations, and I think it could be improved upon. So, you know, when we do a cryo balloon, we, in general, need to have occlusion of the vein to get a successful circumferential mm -hmm. lesion. You can get a lesion wherever you have contact, but you really need to have a good occlusion to easily, with a single shot, isolate the pulmonary vein. And when you freeze it, it uh, becomes very non-compliant and can back out a little bit. Um, there's really, there's two sizes, there's a 23 and a 28 millimeter balloon, but we uh, never use a 23 millimeter balloon. And sometimes even the 28 millimeter balloon is just not big enough. It doesn't fill a common ostium, sometimes it will slide into the vein a little bit. So there's room for improvement with um, different balloon sizes, making it more compliant, avoiding the need to do touch-ups and gaps. There's also, there remains to be uh, issues related to dosing, you know, how long should we freeze, how many lesions should we give, how many freezes should we give, and there's still issues with collateral damage. We looked at the bronchus, uh, freezing the bronchus when we, when we freeze with the balloon. So th things could be improved upon. So let's go through a couple of those. Um, my understanding is that people are moving away from uh, multiple freezes and there's even a movement to a shorter initial freeze, yep. as, as I understand it. So yep. what are you currently doing in your lab? Um, I think it's clear that a four minute freeze that we were doing with the first generation cryo balloon is not needed with the second generation balloon. So we limit almost all of our freezes to three minutes. And if we, we look very, uh, we, we strive to look, for, look at time to isolation. So if you have the, uh, the circular mapping catheter deep in the vein to provide a stiffer rail, you're not going to see when you isolate the vein. There's value to bringing that achieved back to the balloon and looking at the pulmonary vein potentials so that, uh, number one, you can determine how quickly you isolate the vein, and if we isolate the vein in less than a minute, we uh, usually don't get a second freeze. Okay. Um, there's other value, too, because if you isolate the vein, you'll see PV delay in isolation. It, it helps you be more confident that what you're seeing at the end is not PV potentials. It could be far field from the appendage, for example. So I think it's important to look at uh, the PV signals when you freeze. 
So you've moved to a, to a different, it's a new methodology with the balloon you're using yes. and still getting good success. Yeah. So what about new technology or new, uh, if it's not a new balloon, right. just a new, new ways of doing things? Do you have that, some That's a good way that? to categorize. I think there's two um, areas of development. There are areas that are trying to help us use the current balloon better. Right. And then there's uh, developments in new, new balloons. So why don't you take yeah. us to both of those? Well, I think that uh, right now the standard mapping system, you can't visualize the balloon. There's no electrodes on it, so with the current generation map, 3D mapping systems, you can't see the balloon. You can use uh, the Biosense Cardo system and you can use Cardo Sound. You can see the balloon and you can make circles around it and display that on your map. It doesn't tell you where you're in contact, but it does show you where the balloons are. And for people that are doing a lot of uh, extra pulmonary vein ablation with the balloon, you know, people have tried to make roof lines, isolate the whole posterior wall. Yeah, we won't you can talk categorize too much about all that. that. So, yes. But you can see uh, where those, uh, where you've placed the balloon with the Cardo sound system. What about ice? Does ice help at all? Uh, well, this is, the, this is their version of the ice, but we routinely use ice. So, yes, we use ice to determine occlusion. Um, we don't routinely use the 3D sound, but um, an ice image allows you to look for occlusion with color flow before we give contrast. Right. It's a way to minimize contrast. Right. But you, you, raise, you raise a good point. You know, we want to minimize it. The number of times we have to give contrast it requires fluoro, right. it requires contrast injections, and um, so there are techniques that will uh, allow you to do that with standard ice. Right. Um, there are other mapping systems that are being developed that may allow you to do that. So Philips has an EPD system called Codex, which is uh, has a lot of potential because it uses a different way of creating the images. Right. So it uses dielectric imaging and it has the potential to image the balloon and they even have a technique under development where you can determine occlusion uh, by using determining flow from the electrodes on that circular mapping catheter in the vein and determining if you have occlusion without giving contrast. Right. And there's other systems, um, the uh, system Jesse Sra is developing, uh, the Navic 3D system is a way to take advantage of your standard x-ray equipment to develop a three-dimensional image of the balloon and then overlay that with um, the CT scan. So, so most of the new, new research is not, we'll get to the yes, balloons right. in a sec, is really trying to figure out how you can really be sure you've got exactly the kind of occlusion you want and to get the most optimum chance at isolation. And right, there's, right. it sounds like there's a variety of things going on that will help the electrophysiologist in that regard. Right, right. So how about different balloons? Right, well the current balloon um, is under development to make it potentially better, potentially. You know, I think we uh, talked about the ways of trying to image it. Maybe if you put electrodes on the balloon you could see it with standard mapping systems. Uh, you could take the current balloon and come up with different sizes. Um, you could make it more compliant. I think uh, the current Medtronic balloon will have future iterations that will be different sizes and give you more flexibility for, for things like that. Uh, there's other companies developing cryo balloons. Right. So it, it's become, and, and I think the numbers, my understanding is that they have about half the market for first time pulmonary vein isolation. So I think there's a pretty impressive adoption of the cryo balloon and there's really no competition right now for it. So Boston Scientific has a cryo balloon program. The advantages uh, potentially of their balloon is that it's compliant. So when we put the balloon in there uh, with the current uh, Arctic front balloon and freeze, it gets very rigid and can back out. The Boston Scientific balloon is made of, a, of an elastic substance so that it remains at low pressure and remains more compliant, uh, which theoretically could help you get pulmonary vein occlusion. Some of that data was presented at the Heart Rhythm Society last year. So okay. it seems to be an exciting new uh, competitive balloon. So let me switch then just to the end. This is a very nice update. Thank you for, uh, very much, Brad. Um, what, do, what is your, you said, that, I know that as much as you're saying everybody's in lockstep at, at Northwestern, yeah. I'm sure that's not actually true because I know a lot of your colleagues yes. and they wouldn't necessarily be in the same line. So there must, do people have different views, not on the paroxysmal, but the persistence? Yeah. I mean, that's a huge area of debate now. Do you routinely do every persistent with cryo, or is there at some point you pick and choose? We do a lot of persistence with cryo, particularly patients that are early persistent or patients whose left atrial size is normal. If our objective when we go into the case is to just isolate the veins, which 
you know, I can make a strong case for, for mm -hmm. the first time procedure for persistence. If that's the objective, we'll often use the cryo balloon. Uh, but for the redos and for long-standing persistence, I think we all feel with limited data that we should be doing more than just PVI, but I think uh, it's still important we come up with a tool that gives durable, safe pulmonary vein isolation before we really know what else needs to be done. So let me ask you one last thing. Yeah. Let's say as a clinician, because I'm not in the lab doing ablations for AFib anymore, I still do some to BSVD. So uh, if I have a patient that comes to me and has documented flutter and fib, yeah. I think that's important information to when I send that patient yeah. to my colleague. And usually I will tell them, listen, um, this is a patient you're gonna have to probably do RF in, mm -hmm. unless you really wanna you use two separate catheters in uh, as a director yeah. of a lab and a youth uh, director, that's expensive. Yeah. I mean, there have to be some economies, uh, you know, for your No, you your raise lab. an important scenario where it so does do become do a then? cost issue. Often I'll still use a cryo balloon and I'll use RF. You will, you'll I'll use, use two different cheap, cheap RF uh, catheter. <laughs> there and, is no uh, cheap RF catheter. Well, you know, I still use an eight millimeter catheter to ablate a CT. Okay, so, maybe that's a cheap yeah. one. <laughs> But uh, yeah, some of my colleagues will stick with RF in that scenario. Uh, we don't routinely do CTI lines, by the way, for patients. No, I mean document, documented flutter. Yeah, uh, um, and I know yeah. you could argue, and I and I understand this argument that that if you got rid of the fib, you probably get rid of the flutter. Yeah. Okay, and there's maybe a maybe a thirty to fifty or forty percent chance you won't get rid of the fib, and if the flutter was really bothersome yeah, to yeah, the yeah. patient, you don't want to deal with the flutter as a recurrence, right? No, I agree. Right? I think, you, I think so, you can't rely on PVI to solve the typical I don't flutter think that they so. had clinically. Yeah, yeah I don't think so. So that's interesting. So you'll still be stubborn and go ahead with the PVI with the cryo. Yeah, it's a more I know, it's not stubborn. Way. I shouldn't say stubborn. <laughs> I think, you know, when we first looked at our early experience, we were saving about a half an hour of time uh, with per case on average. And I think it removes some of those outliers where you, uh, you struggle. Now, the RF Technology has gotten a lot better since we started doing cryo, so yeah. I, I accept that. But, um, you know, I put it this way, if cryo balloon was first and you could isolate the pulmonary veins and someone came to you with a single point-by-point -point ablation catheter and said, we want you to isolate the pulmonary veins with this, would you would you switch? I think it's RF came first, and so it's... Well, it's, and that's, that's the it. problem if you're good at what you do and yeah. you feel comfortable with it. But uh, I totally, for me, it, I think they're equal. I mean, yeah. the studies have shown they're equal. Yes. And I think it comes down to preference of the uh, operator and make sure they're skillful at the, what they're doing and correct patient selection. I mean, I don't know if I had a persistent AFib that was a 5.2 centimeter left atrium that I would just tell my guys to go in there and do a cryo of the veins right. and get out. Right. Because they're probably gonna find something. We don't do lines and crazy things, but they may find another source when they're in there. Mm -hmm. And I guess you could cryo it, but you know, if you're gonna stick by the rules. but. I think as long as you're good at it, you do what you're good at. But I'm excited that there's advances. And yeah, I personally, if uh, they've won me over, I mean, uh, I think the cryo data are very strong. Yeah, and right now been, I think it's a pretty safe energy yeah, source. I mean, we I talked like about it. cryo balloon, but there's also uh, other cryo-based linear ablation catheters right. that are being developed. So I will tell you this, and I think everybody knows it. I'm an RF guy when it comes to AV node reentry. I'm never going to change that. I just want to tell you. I, Me too. I, I, oh, good. I'm <laughs> yeah. glad to hear that. That everyone tries to t tell you, oh, you have safety if you know what you're doing. You don't you're do about cryo. For focal cryo. Yeah, no, we yeah. don't use focal. Okay, cryo. there you go. Brad, thank yeah, you so thank much. You, Eric. Great, yeah. great, great information. Appreciate thank you. It. Appreciate it.